Sponsored by the James Madison Council and the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, and I have the honor and privilege today of interviewing Joseph Ellis about his latest book, The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents, 1773 to 1783. Uh, welcome very much to our show here, Joseph Ellis. Pleasure to be with you, David. Thank you. So for those who don't know Joseph Ellis, he is one of the country's leading scholars on the Revolutionary War era, area and era. Uh, he is a person who's written 13 books on this subject. He's a graduate of the College of William & Mary, got his PhD at Yale. He's a winner of the Pulitzer Prize and a winner of the National Book Award. His latest book is an explanation of why we went to war with the British and why the British ultimately ended the war unsuccessfully from their point of view. I would say I've read all of Joseph Ellis's books and I enjoyed this one the most and I actually found I learned more from this book than any of the other books. So thank you very much for writing this book. Boy, I'm glad to hear that. You know, the, the author of a book is perhaps the most myopic person in terms of understanding uh, how it will be received, but um, uh, I'm I'm happy with it, and I hope uh, other people will agree with you. If you if you like the book Founding Brothers, which is about the 1790s, uh, I think you'll like this one, which is about the 1770s. And um, I didn't know what I was doing 40 or 35 years ago when I started writing about the late 18th century, but. Uh, it turns out I was trying to write a history of the American founding, and I turned out that I was doing it backwards. And um, this book should have come first chronologically, but I don't think I could have written it uh, 25 years ago. I've, I've learned something since then, thank God. And so, so like a new child, did, you, you hope it's, it's going to do well and you uh, send it out into the world. What attracted you as a young man to devote your career to the American Revolutionary War period and the heroes of that period? Um, I didn't even major in history in college at William Mary, I majored in philosophy. I ended up going to graduate school because I couldn't afford to go to law school. And I got a scholarship and Yale picked me up, gosh knows why, nobody ever understood how I got into Yale. But, um, and then at Yale, I came under the influence of a historian named Edmund Morgan, and uh, he was an early Americanist, and, um, uh, and he set me on my course. A another of my mentors there was a guy called C. Van Woodward, and I worked a lot with him, and, and I asked him if I could write my dissertation on Thomas Jefferson, and he said, uh, no, you're not old enough to, to write a biography. Uh, you have to have lived life a little bit more, and... Um, and so I, I didn't try to do that for another 25 years. But um, that's where I caught it. And uh, I guess coming out of William & Mary and Colonel Williamsburg, I must have had some kind of influence there. But right. um, I've stuck with the late 18th century. There, because I've written biographies of three presidents, Washington, Adams, and uh, Jefferson, I sometimes get identified as a presidential historian. I don't think of myself as a presidential historian. I'm a historian of the founding and, uh, and have written about the three first presidents. But um, uh, at any rate, um, uh, Ed Morgan will let me write the way I wanted to. And, uh, and I think uh, teaching at a liberal arts college allowed me to work on my own stuff in a way that uh, aimed at a general audience rather than just the other group of professional historians. That's too and long an answer through, for you, David, but there you go. Let's go through some of the key points in your book, and I'll remind everybody, I'm, I'm asking questions for another 20 minutes or so, and then there'll be about 10 minutes or so where you can uh, have your questions uh, submitted. So submit them in the chat room, and I will read them uh, subsequently when we get to that section. So the, what, is the, what do you mean by the cause why did you mm -hmm. call your book The Cause? Where did that phrase come from? Um, obvious good question. Um, the, in the early stages of, what, of, of the War for American Independence, uh, nobody uh, called it the American Revolution. The British called it the American Rebellion. 
the colonists starting in 1774, 75, started talking about the common cause, which at the time meant the colony's response to the British occupation of Massachusetts and especially Boston and the rallying of the rest of the colonies to support them in response to what was called the Coercive Acts. And common cause then just got reduced to the cause. And it became a convenient label, a convenient kind of canopy in which uh, people and colonies and individuals with different political agenda could come together. They might not agree on what they were for, but they knew what they were against. They were against uh, British policy and Great Britain's attempt, as they put it, a plot to enslave them. And um, so the cause becomes a coverall term that stays in place till the end of the war. Um, and it's a convenient way for people to believe that they all agree. So uh, the conventional view that I always learned in school was that the British wanted to pay for the effects of having soldiers here following the French and Indian Wars, also known as Seven Year Wars. So they imposed right. a lot of taxes, and the taxes were not popular. But your point of view is that it wasn't the revenue so much that the British wanted. They wanted to make it clear that they were in control of the colonies. Is that right? That's right. That, um, that starting in, in the wake of the end of the, uh, in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, Great Britain gets this a third of a continent, this huge area, including Canada, and they decide they've got to actually govern it. And because up until now, uh, the phrase Burke used was uh, benign neglect. Um, now that they've reached this level of uh, world power, they've got to act like one. And so they begin to, as you say, impose taxes. Why I think it wasn't a money issue, but a power issue, is that the actual cost of enforcing the legislation, putting troops there, having uh, people uh, collecting revenue, was greater than the revenue raised um, right. by the by the taxes. And um, so the Britain had about 140 million, 140,000 pound debt, and they were hoping to reduce it. But they were mostly hoping to assume, to assume control over the colonies. And the colonies perceived that control as, as they put it, this sounds a bit paranoid, but as they saw it as an attempt or a plot to enslave them. Um, there was some truth to that, namely, not that the British intended to enslave, but that once you surrendered control to Parliament, you couldn't be sure how far they would go. What kind, and each move the British make in the 1770s seems to confirm the diagnosis that there is a plot to enslave them. And, um, and so by the time you get to 1775, 76, um, the, uh, the, the Americans believe that the, the Great Britain, which is about to send 32,000 troops and 10,000 sailors to invade them, um, Great Britain is really trying to enslave them. In fact, what the British ministry would say, all we want to do is make you into colonists, second class British citizens to be sure, but not slaves. Nevertheless, uh, that misunderstanding persists. And the British decision to, to militarize this conflict in 1774-5 might stand as the greatest blunder in the history of British statecraft. Um, if you want, I think American readers might be able to understand the British thinking and the British dilemma in the war, perhaps for the first time. I put it this way, a newly arrived world power brimming over with confidence, certain of its invincibility, both economically and militarily, steps into a quagmire in an unnecessary and unwinnable war. That sounds pretty familiar to me. Right. So the um, colonies, your point of view is, they didn't really want to be independent um, up until the moment of the Declaration of Independence. What they really wanted was to have their relationship with um, the British government and basically, each colony would have its own relationship. They weren't really dying to have a United States of America. Is that right? Oh, yeah, you're right. And, um, and um, the reason I'm saying it's such a blunder is that once the war starts going badly for the British by 77, 78, the British say, oh, OK, 
We'll give you everything you wanted. We won't tax you. We'll let your own legislatures do that. We'll even let you have a Continental Congress. If they had said that in 1775, we would have never had a revolution. But by then, it's too late. Too many people have died. Too many towns have been destroyed. Too many women have been raped. Right. And, um, and, it's, and they've, they've missed the opportunity. Now, you point out in your book that today, yeah. Americans probably think that the American colonies were so valuable economically. But in those yeah. days, it was not the American colonies, but the Caribbean colonies where the money was for the British. Is that a fair understanding? And the, the British were more worried about the money to be made from the Caribbean colonies than they were from the money to be made from American colonies. Is that a fair description? That's true, uh, especially Jamaica. Jamaica is more profitable than all the 13 colonies put together. And, um, and when the French come into the war in 78, 1778, uh, uh, the British devote the bulk of their military and naval resources to protecting um, their holding in, in the Caribbean. And because um, that's, that's what they're most afraid of losing. Um, uh, so again, uh, it's, it's, but another contemporary word term, you ever hear of the domino effect? They're afraid if they let the Americans go, then Canada will go, then the Caribbean will go. Um, and so their, their fixation on suppressing the American rebellion is based on the belief that if they let that happen, their entire empire might very well collapse. Now, um, in your book, you point out that the uh, colonial leaders are sending in treaties to King George all the time, thinking, well, he's surely the nice person. If only he knew how bad the parliament was, uh, he would handle this problem appropriately. But he turns out, I think you would point out, he was worse than the parliament in terms of being tough on the, on the colonies. Is that right? It is. That they, there's a consensus that parliament is... Um, is uh, a tyrannical body attempting to impose its will on them. And they begin to develop the argument that George III doesn't know what Parliament's doing. Uh, John Dickinson, uh, one of the early revolutionary uh, pamphleteers, develops this argument that if only George III knew what was going on, he'd stop it all. Uh, and pretty soon, or over, over time, they come to the realization that banking on George III is a hopeless cause because nobody's more committed to imposing Britain's imperial power on the colonies than George III is. And, um, and when the war is over and they're looking for scapegoats, and the first thing you do when you lose a war is look for scapegoats, they should have fastened on George III, but they didn't. They tend to fasten on the generals, Howe, Burgoyne, not so much uh, Cornwallis, and on, but, and on George Germain, the, the equivalent Secretary of Defense. Uh, and because if you fasten on George III, you're, you're fastening on the whole empire. And um, at any rate, before he begins to lose his, uh, he doesn't lose his mind, he has an illness, but before he becomes mentally uh, depraved, um, George III exercises the greatest imperial power of any uh, British king um, since the Glorious Revolution. And uh, and uh, he's the he's the real the real scapegoat. And was George Washington a military genius to win the war with so few troops? Sometimes he, his troops weren't even clothed barely right. and had very few few uh, armaments. Or was he just lucky that the British bungled uh, their effort to win? What was it? He was a genius, or the British bungled, or was it a combination <laughs> of both? Washington himself would say he was partly lucky. He talked about. He said winning the war was like a standing miracle, like God, um, providence, he called it, uh, was on his side. Um, the way I'd put it is that uh, as a general, Washington was not that effective. He lost more battles than he won. Um, uh, if you think about it, most of the great generals in world history, starting with Hannibal and through Napoleon and uh, Rommel and Robert E. Lee, end up losers. Washington wasn't a great general, but he ended up a winner. And at some point, he understood a basic strategic reality that became all-consuming all and crucial, that he didn't have to win the war. The British had to win the war. It's a lot easier not to lose. As long as he kept the Continental Army intact 
Um, and as long as the colonies stayed united behind him, the, the British cause was hopeless. Um, and, um, and he was right about that. Uh, but there is a kind of resilience to him and to the ordinary troops in the Continental Army, who are the, my real heroes in this book, the ordinary troops in the Continental Army, of whom about 10 to 15 percent, by the way, were African-Americans. Um, uh, they're the ones who deserve the real credit. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a seven and a half year long marathon, and, um, uh, and it's a war that's more vicious and barbaric than we imagine. If we had Matthew Brady photographs of this war as we did of the Civil War, we'd think of it differently. If we had artists like Goya instead of the ones like Trumbull, we'd think of it differently. But more Americans died in the American Revolution per capita than any war in American history save the Civil War. And if you get to know what's going on in the countryside, it's really barbaric. The, the final battle of the war, the, the, the really the most important battle at the end, is the battle at Yorktown, where George Washington, in effect, gets Cornwallis to surrender. But the French were indispensable where they're providing the Navy. Why were the French so interested in helping the Americans? Did they have some ulterior motive, or did they really just hate the British more than they liked us? Mostly the latter. I mean, it was payback time, the French thought, for having lost the French and Indian War. And the Americans, in opposing the British, were uh, opposing France's uh, lethal enemy. And um, it turns out, by the way, the French spent so much money helping us um, that uh, they begin to go bankrupt. And it's for that reason they have to call the States General, and that's what starts the French Revolution. But uh, without the French, both in the war and especially at, uh, at uh, the last battle of the war at Yorktown, um, uh, we couldn't have won the war um, at that moment. We, I don't think we would have lost it, but um, Yorktown's mostly a French operation. The French Navy arrives just in the right time. Um, the French are masters of, uh, uh, of trench warfare or, and of moving cannon up. Um, and uh, there's only one American military activity during that battle. That's an attack on one of the redoubts. And it's led by the Rhode Island Regiment, which is a regiment of almost entirely African-American soldiers, 750 of them. Uh, it's, it becomes the leading combat unit in the Continental Army, mostly black. And they take it. Uh, the, the rest of it is a French victory, it's a French operation. And um, when um, when... The American Expeditionary Force uh, arrived in France in 1917 to help the French. The, one of the staff officers for General Pershing said, tell Lafayette, we, are, we have arrived, and it's uh, our turn to pay you back. So the Battle of Yorktown occurs in 1781. Uh, Cornwallis is too embarrassed to uh, kind of show his face at the, at the time of the surrender, so he doesn't do that, but the British surrender. Why did it take two years to negotiate the Treaty of Paris? And what was going on in that two-year period of time? <laughs> um, it's tr it does take uh, two, three, uh, two more years. And there are scrimmages that are, keep going on. The people are continuing to die, especially a guy called John Lawrence, who if he hadn't been killed, would have become one of the major figures in the American government later on. He, and he all, he's one of the people who believes that it's also a war for um, uh, emancipation of blacks. But... Um, that uh, the, the Americans have to decide whether to sign a separate treaty uh, with Great Britain because the French are, are being dragged down by their obligations to Spain, et cetera, et cetera. Because it's dragged out, the Continental Army is up in um, just north of West Point in Newburgh. And uh, it's, uh, as I think you know from the book, that um, the Newburgh... Uh, what do they call it? It's an almost insurrection by the army asking Washington to lead them because they haven't been paid for over a year. Um, they're starving. And they think when the war ends, uh, they're going to lose any leverage to get their, uh, their pensions. And they're probably right about that. And so they threaten uh, to, um, to exercise a coup. And Washington appears before them and gives one of the more important speeches in his life. Um, effectively saying that we cannot repudiate the values we were fighting for. 
I will not lead you in this. And I ask you, I tell you, you must not do this. And, and, um, and they, they follow it at that moment. But um, it's one of the first Washington, uh, when, when later told that George Washington refuses to become the dictator, George III says, if he does that, he'll be the greatest man in the world. Um, uh, and at that moment, he was. You think about it, that's not what Caesar did. That's not what Crom Cromwell did. That's not what Napoleon will do. That's not what Mao will do. That's not what Castro will do. Um, dictators right. tend to believe that they, they are the revolution and have a difficult time separating themselves from it. OK. So uh, we have some questions from those who are viewing. Let me uh, begin with some of them from Anna. Uh, what set you in the path to becoming a historian? What sparked your interest in history? Gosh, um, I think reading biography, I came to history through biography, through lives. And, um, and, uh, and I love biography because there was always a, a center for a center of this topic. And, uh, and I sort of thought, look, we all come into this world the same way and we all leave the same way. And what can we learn by people who were here before us, some of them a thousand years before us? And, um, and so that's perhaps an adolescent way to come to history. But as I said, I didn't major in history at college at William and Mary, I majored in philosophy. And I decided to go forward in history because, among many reasons, as I said, because I couldn't get in, I couldn't pay for law school, but also because you through history could raise, could raise the intellectual questions that I thought philosophy ought usually addressed. Uh, I thought that I was an intellectual historian, whatever the heck that meant. And, um, and so it's a strange path, but um, uh, it worked out for me. Okay. Um, from Mark, we have a question. What role did free African-Americans play in the American Revolution? Free African-Americans. Free African Americans. Um, well, hmm, the the freest, of, of the, of especially in New England, which there were the greatest number of free African Americans, uh, served in both the, the New England militia and in the and then in the Continental Army. Um, about ten thousand uh, over time. Roughly the same number of freed blacks who were who escaped uh, to the British Army served in the British Army. In the British Army, they were not allowed to serve in combat units. In the American Army, they were. And the service of African Americans in the Continental Army was the last time you had a genuinely integrated American military force until the Korean War. Um, so now I feature Billy Lee in the book as a profile. Billy is George Washington's manservant, is with him the whole, the whole war. Um, and Washington frees him in his will. Um, and on the other side, there's a man named Harry Washington who escapes from Mount Vernon and serves with the British and uh, ends up uh, being uh, evacuated out of New York at the end of the war, going to Nova Scotia, and then eventually back to Sierra Leone. An interesting pattern. But one black man serves the cause with the commander in chief, and the other goes and pursues his own freedom with the British and eventually achieves it. Though when he gets to Sierra, Sierra Leone, he helps lead a, a movement uh, and a resistance to British rule, claiming, ironically, they're being taxed without their consent. Um, but it's it's two different black men choosing different courses for the same reason: liberty. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, uh, what what happened? Suppose we had lost the war. The Americans had lost the war. If, how would history be different? Because wouldn't we eventually yeah. have become free? Or you think it's too early, to, too hard to predict? Oh, um, if we had, if we had, it depends on how we lost it. If we lost it in a real military way, and they could have lost it at the Battle of New York and Long Island, um, then they would have taken all of the. Uh, American leaders, including Washington, Jefferson, and all, carried them over to England, gave them a show trial, hung them, quartered their bodies, and put their severed heads on um, on uh, spikes around uh, West, uh, Westminster. And um, if they lost the war towards the end, and the American army just disintegrated, and Yorktown didn't happen, it would have been a more peaceful uh, 
negotiation. And we would have begun to see 50 years earlier, the creation of something called the British Commonwealth. And uh, we would have been the first, followed by Canada and Australia and New Zealand, to remain in the empire, be economically connected to the empire, but have our own political independence. Okay, so here's a question from Anna. Can you tell us about what you're working on now and what are you currently reading? Uh, um, what am I working on now? Well, when you finish a book and they, you're about half finished because the publisher wants you to go all over the place and uh, advertise it, but um, I'm working, I'm thinking about a next book. I mentioned this to you earlier, David, and I'll share it with the audience. I mean, a book that asks the question, why the founders failed to end slavery? Uh, I do think they failed that. They, I think that's a tragedy that could have happened differently. Um, and uh, while I do think they're among the greatest leaders in American history, uh, in political terms and creative terms, I think they failed on that all important issue. And I want to know why. And um, there are reasons that I think we haven't thought about before. Um, what am I reading now? Um, I'm reading a book about the Red Sox in the glory years of uh, their last uh, pennant race and um, hoping that it turns out to be a prediction of what they do this year. Okay. So what was, uh, for Marion, what would you say was John Adams' most important contribution and why was he chosen to be the first vice president? Um, actually, Adams' most important contribution was made early in the game in the 1760s and early 70s you can see this in the film and the, in the play of 1776. He is the force for recognizing that American independence is inevitable and that uh, America, as he put it, was looking for a messiah that would never come. Um, later on, uh, he becomes vice president because he gets the second number of votes uh, after Washington in the election of 1789. He hates the vice presidency. He says it's... Um, I guess, you know, the most uh, ridiculous idea ever invented by the mind of man. Um, but one of the things that some listeners might be surprised by, that the first four presidents of the United States, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and uh, Madison, did not regard the presidency as the capstone of their careers. They regarded it as an epilogue. Adams thought his greatest contribution came in the run-up to the revolution. Washington thought his greatest contribution was made during the war, winning the war. Jefferson believed his greatest contribution was the Declaration of Independence. Madison believed his greatest contribution was leading up to the Constitutional Convention. We overvalued the presidency then. I would also make the case, this is my own view, that none of the early American presidents would ever run for president in the kind of political conditions required now. They would regard as an act of prostitution. So we have just two minutes left. Here's another question from Niels. How aware was the average American about the war as it was being fought, given that actual battles were mostly small and dispersed mm. in time and geography? This guess is a deep thing, and I'll try to be really brief because our time is limited. At the local level, what happens is committees of safety and, ins and inspection are created in 75 that make it impossible for someone living anywhere in America, no matter how far away, from remaining neutral during the war. That probably would be the biggest group, 40 or 50 percent. They just love to get on with their ordinary lives. But you're required uh, to make a commitment. And if you don't make the commitment to the cause, that's where the cause is a phrase again. Um, your neighbors are going to shun you. Um, you're going to eventually be banished. You're not going to be killed but you're going to be forced to face the fact that you're going to be cast out of the congregation. Um, and it's because of that that the British can never win the war because they can win every battle. And after every battle, as soon as they leave, the other side takes over. Now, unless the loyalists leave with them, they're going to be punished. Um, and so it's the, it's the war at the ground level in the countryside that makes it impossible for the British to win the war. And ordinary Americans are forced to take a clear position in a way that many of them would prefer not to have had them done. All right, we have 30 seconds left. What is the main message of this book that you would like somebody to take away from this book in 30 seconds? Um, we're fortunate to have had a group of people leading us at the beginning who regarded the public interest rather than 
the popular interest at, in charge. It's a republic, right, not a democracy. Um, and how much we owe the ordinary soldiers in the Continental Army, and that our mystic cords of memory should go back to them. And capacity for irony and paradox. This is why the subtitle is, and it's discontents. Right. When we end the war, uh, we are incapable of dealing with the Native American issue effectively and, and with the slavery issue effectively because the government is a confederation of sovereign states. It is all pluribus, no unus. The term United States is a plural noun, not a singular noun. And that leads us to tragedy. Okay, we've been in conversation with Joseph Ellis, one of the country's leading historians on the Revolutionary War period of time and that colonial period of time about his new book, The Cause. Joseph, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you, David.